It has been more than two months since the Russian-Ukraine conflict broke out. Western countries have placed the sanctions on Russia's economy. As situations worsen, the neutral countries are being demanded to take sides. What profound impacts are these events possibly have on the current global order? Recently, I talked to Professor Joseph Knight from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs in the 1990s and is considered one of the most influential scholars on American foreign policy. Take a look. Professor Nye, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. Now, some suggest there is a generational gap even among the academics and policymakers in the United States. Now, Professor, do you see that divide apparently that's existing? Well, there is a division by generations. That's always been true. Um, each generation thinks that the older generation was wrong. Um, <laughs> but that's why I, I think it's important to teach the younger people about uh, history so they have some sense of perspective about these changes. So in some, in some sense, yes, the, the current new generation is critical of the old, but that's always been true. We have seen with the Russian-Ukraine conflict, for example, a few academics uh, that has been talking about, uh, you know, the earlier warning uh, not to push Russia uh, into a corner uh, so that to lead to crisis like what we are having today. Uh, even Dr. Kissinger decades ago also talked about that. Now, at least those are the messages that many here in China have been hearing. So, Professor Nye, how do you see, you know, the uh, long-term impact of policies uh, from the U.S. perspective? Well, I think if you would look back to the 1990s, uh, you would say that uh, the Americans did try to make efforts to uh, accommodate the Russians after the end of the Cold War. Uh, could we have done more? Probably. Uh, on the other hand, there are some of the changes that have been going on today, which are deep inside Russia and not caused by the United States. So I, I, I think that uh, the question of the current events in Ukraine, when, the, when people say it's because of NATO expansion, that may have contributed something to the cause. But if you go back to Putin's speech at the uh, 2007 Munich Security Conference. Uh, it, it was more, uh, if that came before the announcement of any efforts to in, involve Ukraine and NATO, which happened in 2008. And Putin's views on, on Ukraine not being a real country go back to the 1990s. So in retrospect, um, perhaps we could have played it better, but there's also a view that uh, some of this was caused by things deep inside Putin's mind and deep inside Russia. Some have been suggesting, for example, Professor John Mearsheimer, I know you have very different opinions uh, compared to him, but have been suggesting, you know, at the end of the day, it's all power politics. It's also rule of the jungle, zero sum game. Uh, for example, the United States uh, uh, with this war in Iraq, the Bush doctrine, the earlier Monroe doctrine have all been asking the neighbors uh, in a way not to have it their own independent foreign policy and can go into a country and start a war without uh, the support of the United Nations Security Council. So now more accusations against the Russia in this sense, certainly there's uh, some kinds of double standard to say the least. And meanwhile, eventually it is the rules of the jungle that really works. Uh, Professor, your take. Well, uh, it's true that power politics has existed forever and will continue. But we did, after 1945, set up a basic norm uh, in the UN Charter, which said you don't steal your neighbor's territory by force, uh, you don't invade them militarily, unless you do it with a resolution of the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Um, the Americans violated that in 2003, 
when they went to Iraq without a resolution. I opposed that at the time, as did John Mearsheimer. Um, and I think the, uh, the, the danger I see today is not whether the Americans made a, a mistake or did something wrong in the past. It's if Russia gets away with what it's done, uh, first seizing Crimea by force and now invading uh, Ukraine itself uh, by force, if it gets away with that, um, breaking the norm of, uh, to, of 1945 that's in the UN Charter, then uh, Mearsheimer may turn out to be right, that there'll be no restraints. But then on the other hand, people could also say, uh, then the rest of the world should now exercise uh, sanctions against the United States. After all, you already violated the uh, principle back in 2003 against Iraq. Uh, so uh, how would you comment about that? I think the, uh, the U.S. actions in 2003 were wrong because we did not have a U.N. Security Council resolution. The U.S. Uh, did lose a great deal uh, through its actions. American soft power uh, declined very seriously after the invasion of Iraq without a Security Council resolution. But could you also argue the same about Russia, that they have lost uh, to a certain extent their smart power as a result of the military action against Ukraine, and therefore they're being quote unquote punished already? And why more sanctions against Russia? I'm not here to you know, explain or to justify for Russia, but you know, just uh, the same principle one would argue would should apply to uh, to apply to everybody. Well, I think Russia is uh, uh, suffering its both its soft power and in its economic uh, situation as a result of its actions. Uh, so I think that uh, what we look back on in 2014, when it seized Crimea by force. Uh, the sanctions were not strong enough to uh, to basically set a principle that you shouldn't do it again. So I think the point of the sanctions today, the financial sanctions and trade sanctions, are to say uh, this has to be taken more seriously than it has been in the past. Let me switch to another topic about China-U.S. relations. I know this is a, a very hard uh, not to crack. However, we have not seen situations improved uh, recently uh, compared to two years ago. Now, Professor Nye, with the midterm election coming and uh, politics getting ever more complicated, where do you think things are going? Well, I worry about U.S.-China relations because um, of what I would say, there's a rise of nationalism both in China and in the United States. This makes it very difficult to manage the relationship. I agree with uh, former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who says we should think of it as a, uh, a competitive coexistence. Um, I've called it a, we should think of it as a cooperative rivalry. But as people get it locked into these extreme positions, it becomes harder to maintain that. Now, do you see there is real content uh, efforts to make things better or mainly superficial gestures to interact with one another? Well, I think that uh, we should have more meetings at the top, more frank discussions. We should also have more uh, contacts at the middle and lower levels. Uh, for example, having frequent meetings among scientists, uh, that's the way to deal with questions of the next pandemic. So I think it's a huge mistake to cut off ties. We are going to have differences. We have real differences, but uh, it, it, it has to have a, a constant set of contacts at the top, at the summit, and it also has to have a constant set of contacts at other working levels throughout the relationship. Mm. Professor, there has been some talking about in the United States that things are changing so fast. And as a result of uh, uh, the best benefits for the United States, the US should less theorize what it wants to do and how to achieve it and how to look at the world, but focusing on doing it 
uh, for its best benefits. How do you look at theories like this, both why it is having a nurturing ground and also if things like these become the mainstream, what does that mean? Well, that's why I uh, resist something like you mentioned John Mearsheimer's it's all power politics. Yes, there are power politics, but that's not all there is. And the book that I just published, Do Morals Matter, argues, yes, you start with realism uh, as a theoretical approach or power politics, but you don't stop there. There are other things that, uh, that we can do in relations with each other. And I think that's uh, uh, the important point here. Basically, uh, if we succumb to ideology, uh, and this is a new Cold War or something like that, um, we miss the opportunities for cooperation. And I think that makes us both worse off. I asked both the former Chinese ambassador to the United States, Cui Tiankai, and also I heard from answers uh, from uh, Max Baucus, the former U.S. ambassador to China during the Obama administration, talking about their concerns that this is not going to be a Cold War of nuclear, but rather a possibility of going into the danger of a Cold War about culture and about technologies. Now, Professor Nye, where do you think is the state of this bilateral relations now between China and the United States? Well, I think they're in a difficult stage. If you take a historical perspective, remember that after 1949, we had 20 years in which the two countries uh, had very little relationship. Indeed, we even went to war with each other in Korea. Then after Nixon's visit to, uh, to Mao uh, in 72, you had 20 years in which we cooperated against the Soviet Union. Then after the end of the Cold War, under Clinton and Bush, you had uh, 20 years of engagement trying to develop economic relations. And now we're starting a new cycle. Uh, it starts in the Trump period. Um, and uh, I hope that doesn't go 20 years. But um, the point is that we have seen ups and downs in the US-China relationship in the past. My own view is that neither China nor the US poses an existential threat to the other. And therefore, we should keep a long-term perspective and realize that while we'll have differences, uh, Kevin Rudd's suggestion of competitive coexistence uh, is probably the right way to think about the long-term. Why do you say China and the United States are not an uh, uh, existential threat to each other? Well. Um, the U.S. can't conquer China, and China can't conquer the U.S. Neither of us could do to each other what Russia is just doing to Ukraine. In addition to that, if you look at the, uh, the question of can the U.S. destroy China's economy? Can China destroy U.S. economy? We can hurt each other. We can't destroy it. And then if you look at the third aspect, which is that when we deal with climate change, which is going to have big effects on both countries. So we have to cooperate on these things. So the idea that this is a fight to the death or an existential threat, such as you're seeing in Russia and Ukraine today, that's not the, it's a good description of the US-China relationship. We have seen the emphasis on the global visions and the global issues, but obviously, people are extremely interested in talking about the Cold War, the hot war, scenarioize them and, uh, you know, even some fantasize about them. Is this our human nature or this is the intention of uh, interest groups uh, to uh, drag the rest of the population with them? Well, unfortunately, humans always divide into groups. Uh, whether it's a level of nations or in school, there's one group, there's another group. I mean, this is, this is human nature, but it doesn't mean that we have to let those groups get into severe conflict. And I say in that sense, the role of good leadership is to avoid letting this natural inclination for dividing ourselves into competing groups to keep the competition limited and not to let it overflow into more serious conflict. Professor Joseph Nye, 
Always a pleasure. Thank you so much, sir, for your time and also your sharing of thoughts.